Hello. Hello. Hey. I think we're probably ready to start. Uh, you want to flip to the first slide and get the show on the road? All right, let's get it started. Okay. So, hello everyone. I'm free to guide you through the first part of our journey on the Trail of Bits testing handbook. So, today we kick off our webinar series with an overview of SEMGRAPH. So, alongside me is Matt Schwager, and on the chat we have Spencer Michaels ready to take up your questions. So, excited to have you all join us today. So, we, have, we all have been able to use SEMGRAPH tool to do incredible things, and we want you to do the same where you can quickly find bugs or you can even have, let's say, rudimentary trail of its audit on every commit. So we created something like testing handbook to achieve this goal. So uh, yeah, we wrote it, it's awesome. And the rest of this webinar follow its content. So go to the browser next to this webinar window and follow along if you like. So yeah, it's available at appset.guide and uh, it's based 100% on our engineers' practical experience with the actual tools we use in our security audits. Each section of this guide goes through a peer review process and is technically edited. In addition, uh, we don't want to rephrase other high quality resources available, so we often refer to these resource, resources and research. Uh, we also create this guide with the support of the actual developer of these tools, and they give us valuable feedback that we can pass on to you. Uh, also, we prioritize the ICD integration in contrast to one shot command line and we provide guidance how to optimize, optimize it in your pipelines. And we believe in continuous improvement, which is why we have made this testing handbook repository public, and your feedback is always welcome as well as uh, new ideas. So last note, our audit reports also include long-term recommendation for clients, so we are able to refer our clients to this constantly updated resource uh, providing more and more value to our audit reports. So yeah, in short, to use SEMGRIP, you obviously need to install the tool. So this is possible via Python, pip, brew, Docker container. So go to your directory and run specific tool sets. For example, as I showed you, SEMGRIP config auto. Hey, Mache, quick question. This config auto option, it seems really useful, but it also seems kind of opaque. It's not really clear to me what it's doing on the back end. Would you mind elaborating on that a little bit? Yeah, so you know, the rule set is the set of the rules that contain specific security checks and use auto mode to automatically detect and use relevant rule sets. And usually it looks at your file extension and content of those files to select relevant rules. So this is the first step to automatically see your code and, uh, you know, uh, select the relevant rules. And um, the last step is to analyze the output as I showed you on the screen and fix the bug. So a quick intro to SEMGRIP. So SEMGRIP has open source code with less strict li licensing compared to other tools like CodeQL. Uh, we don't have to upload the code anywhere and we can run SEMGRIP 100% locally. And uh, this allows us to make sure that no private data will be leaked to a third party behind uh, telemetrics. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to highlight. You know, in a lot of these contexts, it'll often be security sensitive. You know, and, and for us, our clients are obviously going to be sensitive about the code that we're auditing. So, are there any metrics that SEMGREP collects that we should be aware of? Yeah, so there are some metrics sent online, especially when using the auto configuration. So of course it's possible to disable it, but first no source code is uh, sent anywhere and no details. And if some telemetrics, they are clearly described in some docs. So uh, no worries, and you can disable it using specific environment variable or uh, argument uh, passed in CLI. So the main advantage advantage of SEMGRIP is that it's very easy to use. Uh, installation is one command, the same as updates, and we can easily point to the location on the disk to the rules we want to use, or 
we you can use predefined rule sets so that way we know exactly what will be run and scans usually takes minutes or even seconds not hours or days so yeah in, in general sangrep allows you to find bugs in the contents of the file it seems like you're focusing on this single file aspect quite a bit is there anything else we should be aware of here like how does that con contrast with other parts of the SEMGREP application. Uh, sorry, could you ask, the, ask again the question? Yeah, you're mentioning uh, that SEMGREP f focuses on single file analyses. Why is that important here? Yeah, okay, gotcha. Uh, so, yeah, so that means that the SEMGREP in its basic form allows you to identify bugs located with a single file. So if the bug is spread over several files, for example, because of imports, it will not catch it. Uh, but the pro version allows uh, cross-file support. Yeah, so what's important from a security auditing perspective, building the code is not needed. And practically, it's not always possible when performing a security audit. So you know, we are not limited by that fact. And uh, there are lots of existing rules, free, uh, third party rules like those published by Trail of Bits and uh, let's say noisy rules published by community. For example, a bunch of rules for C, C, good for pointing out places for further investigation. And uh, there are also pro rules in the paid subgroup version. So they also cover scanning between files. So when it comes to subgroup, it supports more than 30 languages. But yeah, we have to remember that the implementation has different maturity and this maturity varies in terms of language parse rate, number of rules, uh, applicable SEMGREP syntax, available support, and so on. And uh, yeah, another a very important aspect is that SEMGREP has a data flow analysis engine and allows for both constant propagation, that is, checks whether a variable has a constant value at the particular point in the program. And uh, we also can use time tracking in SEMGREP. So it's useful for writing rules like uh, catching injection bugs, such as cross-site scripting, because a lack of sanitization. So, yeah, in general, when using a uh, static analysis tool, we should answer the question of what languages it supports, because that's the most important aspect, if it's really useful for us. So, generally, some group is very good for languages like c Go, Java, Kotlin, Ruby, PHP. But mostly we don't use it for Solidity and C, C++ auditing. And behind the typical ones, languages, some words can match generic patterns in languages that it does not yet support. Uh, a good example is Nginx config file. Uh, so this kind of file has some structure. So it's possible to catch some insecure patterns similarly to Jixi tool. And um, some group has native support for JSON and YAML. So these are also good for writing rules for configuration files such as GitHub Actions, uh, Kubernetes uh, configuration, and so on. You've been mentioning this term static analysis quite a bit. I think it might be helpful if we did a little bit more of a deeper dive on that. Would you mind digging into that a bit? Yeah, yeah, that's that's very very good question. So yeah, let's take a quick look at the concept of uh, static analysis. So what exactly is static analysis? So if you want to break it down into its simple terms, so it's essentially a method by which we can analyze code without actually running it. So how does this happen? Well, a static analysis tool typically traverses something known as abstract syntax trees or ASTs. So an AST as a data structure used to represent the structure of a piece of code. So it's a sort of tree representation of the source code written in some formal language. And uh, by this, we can establish the order of operations to determine whether a function is called or not, uh, track the movement of data through the program, for example, variables and values. And also we can verify the validity of the code. And as you can see uh, at the bottom, from a higher level perspective, static analysis tools such as SEMGREP 
um, get this source code, like Go, PHP, Python, parse it into some intermediate representations such as AST, uh, then the tool processes it using some engine uh, with some security checks and pattern matching, and the payoff is security bugs. So, yeah. hey Matt, uh, could you give us a quick overview of what we have learned so far? Yeah, sure. So Mache has been covering a lot of details and he will continue to cover a lot of ground here. So I'm gonna provide a few recaps as we go. So what have we learned so far? I think with this first bullet point, the biggest thing you'll note is that we say it finds bugs, not necessarily it finds security bugs. So one thing to keep in mind with SEMGREP is that it's great for correctness issues, best practices, performance issues, not necessarily just security bugs. Another key takeaway is that it's very simple to use. You know, it's just point and shoot one command. You point it at directory and go. And the config auto mode, as Mache discussed earlier, makes it even simpler. And in that vein as well, you don't need to build the code. So compared to a lot of tools, uh, SEMGREP is very fast, it's very easy to use, and it's quick to get started uh, using it on your own code bases. And as Mache highlighted, the free version, you're gonna be doing single file analyses, but if you wanna upgrade to the paid version and uh, pay SEMGREP, then you'll get multi-file or inter-procedural analyses uh, able to do deeper types of analyses for you know injection style bugs let's say one class of issues and with that i'll pass it back to mache who's going to explain how we use semgrep at trail of bits yeah, okay thanks for this recap and so let's dive into how we use semgrep at trail of bits specifically so usually we begin with running the tool on the source code with some prepackaged rules and so the rule set depends on the target, language, and so on. So you can explore them in SEMGREP uh, registry, and it's possible to differentiate rule set based on languages, uh, frameworks, security categorizations such as OWASP top 10, secrets, SQL injection, and so on, or configuration files like Docker files, Terraform, Kubernetes. Um, it's also possible to glue together a couple rule sets so they can be run at the same time. So trail of bits, you know, kind of hypothetically, we're, we're the experts at this, but how do you go about querying the registry for what you're looking for? You know, like if I have a large code base, how, how might I know what to, to look for in the registry there? Yeah, so generally speaking, you can begin with some default like auto and default rule sets, then you can use tools like clock or toke to go through your code and say what you have there, what kind of languages, frameworks, and so on. And you can narrow down to language specifics. Uh, also, don't forget to cover other types of files like configuration files, uh, because it's very beneficial as well. So, yeah, another key concept at Trail of Bits is our private SEMGREP library. So you know, the first step is that we have some rule idea, we create private Trail of Bits rule, and when it gets more and more mature, uh, we finally release uh, it publicly to you. So yeah, when it comes to auditing, we usually begin with some standard rule sets, then move into our public, public and private ones. So having private rules and private library of rules allows us to identify bugs on a larger scale. So we have this library by collecting ideas from new rules, so both bugs found on the internet, our own ideas, Slack like conversation, and during audits. And after each audit, we create new custom rule. And those custom rules are used in another audit. So it's a snowball effect for us. So some of them become public and you can use them now using trail of bits uh, rule set. 
And uh, the last step is to triage the bugs. So, it, so that means it's confirm if they are true or false positive, dig a little bit better, uh, deeper, and so on. So the, the serif format comes in handy here. That serif acronym might be unfamiliar to some of those uh, attending. Would you mind elaborating on that? How does that help us do our jobs faster, triage bugs quicker? Yeah, so the serif format is very handy and it allows us to jump to the specific lines of code in VS quickly, uh, VS code quickly uh, to, conf to con confirm specific bugs, especially when we have hundreds of them. Uh, you can use VS Code with Sari Viewer for this, but we also are going to release Sari Explorer soon. So if you want to become a beta tester, send us an email and we will give you opportunity to test it out uh, much earlier. You can uh, have, you, you have lots of functionalities there, like um, you can confirm the bug or uh, write notes for specific findings, which is very, very useful. Uh, when triaging. And um, yep, that's it. Uh, another important aspect when triaging the bug is to say that it's okay to have some false positive when using SEMgrep and internally we have rules that are more noisy for further digging. And with some experience with SEMgrep, you can point out false positive pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, another topic a bit on the side are ephemeral rules. So this is usually a way to quickly use some grep in a command line, like you use grep, rip grep, or weekly. So of course you cannot expect the most reliable results based on the based on this, but you can quickly find interesting places to dig in the billions of lines of, of lines code. So uh Matt, it's a lot of info that we went through in the last couple of slides. Could you please summarize it? Yeah, let's do another quick recap here. So, you know, we discussed a little bit about how uh, Trail of Bits uses SEMgrep, some of the rule sets available. I think one useful thing to highlight here is that there are a lot of rules out there. I think SEMgrep themselves have over 2,000 or 2,500 rules at this point. Uh, coverage across things like XSS, OWASP top 10, all kinds of different vulnerability classes. I think we have something like 100 public rules ourselves. So there's a lot of great rules out there, uh, which is going to be the, the fastest way to get started. Mache touched a bit on the registry and how you can visit the registry and look through all those rules and rule sets for you know, if you're writing Go code, go look for Go in the registry. If you're looking for, as it says here, XSS, go look for XSS rules in the registry. It's a great way to um, find other rule resources. Mache also talked, touched on the serif format, which is static analysis, something, something format, but basically it's a JSON-like format specifically for static analysis findings. It's also what GitHub uses for their static analysis findings uh, in pull requests. So if you're working with static analysis tools, you're probably going to see this format come up at some point. And it's a great way to integrate static analysis results into other tools like, let's say, VS Code or GitHub pull requests. And then the biggest thing is going to be building your own private rule portfolio. So at the end of the day, you're really gonna get the best results from SEMgrep if you're writing your own private rules catered to your own code base. Uh, things like best practices or security issues that are highly specific to your specific code. Again, that's, you know, obviously that's gonna be the most accurate for, for your specific code. So there, there's no really no replacement for writing your own rules. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Mache, who's going to explain how to do exactly that. OK, thank you very much. So here we present the simplest SEMCAP rule. And uh, as we mentioned before, it's based on YAML. So starting from the top, 
rules is the required key that defines a list of rules we are configuring. Then we have ID that is identifier for the rule. So usually that's the name that it's based on the type of finding that we aim to catch. So here we have command dash injection. So that indicates that the rule is intended to catch any potential command injection issues. Uh, then we have pattern. So it's an attribute for a piece of code to flag on what distinguishes SEMgrep is that the syntax is pretty similar to the semantic of the uh, code we are targeting. And in this case, it looks for uses of the exec command with any argument, uh, which is obviously used in Go to execute system commands. Uh, then we can see potential command injection message. So this message will be displayed when the SEMgrep tool detects code matching this pattern. Uh, then we have uh, languages array, and this specifies the programming languages which this rule should be run on. Um, and the last one is severity, so defines the severity level of the warning raised by this rule. So we can choose between error, warning, or uh, informa informational. And uh, on the right side, we can see how to use this custom rule. So just argument contains the path to our rules or the directory with couple rules under scan that's obvious statistics how many files have been scanned with certain amount of rules at the progress bar and scanning took about one second and uh, then we have one code finding and it's uh, main.go file and the potential command injection was uh, in line 16. Yeah, YAML's nice and all. It seems pretty easy, but is there any way that we could get up and running even faster? Like, I don't want to have to install this thing locally yet. Yeah, so writing some rules in YAML can be tricky because of white space sensitivity, where a small mistakes can destroy anything, everything. Uh, some group seems to have complex syntax, especially at the beginning, and it's hard to debug custom rules when writing in a text editor because you have to switch between terminal and text editor and so on. So you can use some grep playing grounds. It's kind of IDE in a web for writing custom rules. So it has syntax hunting, highlights potential errors, allows you to inspect rules. And if you have test in your rules, it shows the output. Uh, also, we can share your role, role results using share button. So you get unique link and you can quickly ask someone to help you write the role. And um, very important aspect is that some playground offers writing modes simple uh, on the left and advanced. So simple mode allows you to easily combine different logical patterns and advanced just give you uh, syntax highlights. So uh, let's look at the most important elements of the basic syntax when writing some group rules. So the first element is ellipsis, so the same operator as in the first presented some group rule. So we can say that this ellipsis, I mean, three dots mean whatever. So they really allows flexible pattern matching because you can match arguments, statements, parameters, variables, types, and so on. So you know, let's see the first example. And we have conditional statement uh, expression that tries to catch any patterns that contains if, return, and else and uh, just typical full conditional statement in a programming language uh, and we try to catch it regardless of arguments because of those ellipses. Mm, the second example matches any pattern with request get function that has verify is false option so this ellipses I mean this three dots tells us zero or more arguments uh, in the end uh, in the beginning and uh, at the end uh, of the request get argument. So in short, we can flag the use of request get with the verify false option, no matter where uh, that option is placed in the function argument. So it's pretty handy. So another aspect when writing a custom rules is meta variable. So what exactly is uh, meta variable? So it's an abstraction used to match the code when the exact value is not known in advance and it can include 
variables, functions, uh, arguments, and so on. And uh, we can use them in a rule by referring to them with a dollar sign followed by their name. And it's very important that they can only contain uppercase characters, dash, and digits. So the first top example shows that we want to catch the function test one to three, and we can see that they we can use this x meta variable in the message as well when producing message output. And uh, the bottom image shows that the port meta variable is used for comparison. So by using, by using this port variable uh, comparison, the rule checks if uh, the port provided to the set port function is 80 or 443. Hey, Macha, I have another quick question. Yeah. So I just learned about the ellipsis operator. Seems like ellipsis and meta variables are both doing the same thing to me like they're both looking for anything or whatever like why would i use one over the other so when you need to capture the code and use it elsewhere like in message or in an other pattern use meta variable because it just keeps the output and can analyze the output uh, if you need just performance and you don't need to, and you don't have to do anything with the with the, this part of code. Just use uh, ellipses. Okay. So meta variables are useful when you're reusing the contents of the meta variable. Yeah, exactly. So another key aspect in writing custom rules is operators. So understanding them is crucial to write effective rules because they allows us to combine different patterns. So We'll cover a couple of them in the next couple slides. And yeah, uh, by the way, but Matt, just can you provide a short recap of what we have gone through so far? Yeah, it seems like there's a lot going on here. We got a lot of operators. So let's do a quick recap. To me, SEMGREP's biggest contribution is the fact that the patterns you write are basically written in the code of the target language. So if you're looking for Python bugs, the patterns you write are basically going to look like Python. Prior to that, you know, you'd be doing abs abstract syntax trees or you'd be doing tree algorithms looking for, you know, managing state across different analyses, um, doing complex data flow analysis yourself. The beauty of SEMGREP is that you don't have to learn any of that. There's no real complex DSLs. There's no real code that you have to write. You're not writing SQL-like queries. You're basically just writing uh, the target code to look for specific patterns. And that's with a few um, things sprinkled in, as Maciej alluded to, you know, meta variables and ellipsis operator. But other than that, it's really just the target code. And then on top of that, you're going to be using uh, a number of operators to combine those patterns and you know basic things like logical ands logical ors regexes if you're looking to uh, look for certain types of strings doing basic comparisons you know is this port port 80 is it 443 uh, is this integer value less than this other integer value you know basic comparisons like that so that's going to that's what you're going to use to build on top of the patterns. And again, just pointing out the SEMGREP playground, it's very useful for collaboratively working on rules. You know, I'll often be using it if I have an issue and I want to share it with somebody else so that they can help me debug a problem I, be, I may be having with a SEMGREP rule that I'm working on. And I'll also point out that the docs are very good. You know, when you're working on your first 10 or 20 SEMGREP rules, you're really going to be just living in those docs, getting kind of the, the understanding of how these rules and these operators and these patterns work. Uh, in this presentation, we're really, you know, we're operating at a little bit higher level discussing how we use the tool, but really digging into the docs is going to be your best bet for learning how to use the tool and learning how to write rules. And with that, I'll pass it back to Maciej, who's going to give us a few examples. Uh, thank you very much. So, okay. Uh, 
here is the first example of using different patterns in practice. So suppose we ask Sandgrub to notify us when two conditions are met. The first one, the conditional statement, if one is less than two, and the execution of OS system function with any argument. So in summary, we need a rule that requires exactly two of the patterns to be presented in the code. So we can easily look up in the documentation what we need and okay, I need logical end of uh, several patterns, so I need to use the patterns operator. So, okay, here we go. Uh, on the right side, we see the same group rule. So the patterns in the fifth line that combines from two pattern operators. The first one is an if statement and uh, pay attention to, to, to those three dots uh, below this if statement. Uh, let's say to capture the body of, of this uh, conditional statement. And the second, the OS system function with ellipses uh, in the function arguments to match any, any argument of, of this function. And in the rightmost uh, code snippet, we can see that only fourth line is highlighted. So because this one only meets these two conditions. So patterns is logical and as you're talking about and looks like uh, next in the list is pattern either logical or would you mind digging into that a little bit too? Yeah, sure. So yeah, let's move on to the second example and let's say, okay, Sandra, please tell me if one of the dangerous functions is used OS system or exec. So this way we can quickly look up in the doc what to use for logical or this time. And the solution here is pattern either operator. So okay, uh, let's say, take a let's take a closer look at the example. And we can see that under the mandatory patterns operator, we use pattern either and two pattern to Log logically connect those uh, patterns. So uh, yeah, this allows us to combine the patterns of potentially dangerous functions. And we can see in the rightmost code snippet that any call to exec or OS system are called by some group. Cool, let's move on to pattern regex. Yeah, so yeah, now consider another scenario. And let's say we want to find any IP address in the function argument. So basically, uh, we need a same group rule that matches the specific regex pattern. And as before, we look at the doc and we can see that we can just use the pattern regex operator. So under the mandatory patterns in third line, we use pattern regex with appropriate regular expression. And finally, uh, we catch only this line that has string with IP address. Cool. Yeah, we're getting pretty close to time here, so let's keep moving along. Okay, uh, so uh, let's consider a bit more advanced rule. And again, uh, we want to detect the use of dangerous functions such as evil or unsafe. And we know from the previous slide that we can use pattern either for that as before. However, we don't want to throw an error when one of them has the safest true option. So as usual, we look at the doc and we can see that we can use pattern not operator to remove results that, mark, that match the specific expression. So here the recipe is pattern not plus pattern either. And uh, so now we need to combine them somehow. And we can see on the presented role that we have effectively did it and um, we have Two patterns under pattern either operator, so that's line fifth and six, gives us logical or as before. This way, we ask some hey, just catch any evil or unsafe function. And then we uh, exclude any use of this function with the safe is true uh, option uh, twice in line seven and eight. So this all happens, I mean, pattern either, pattern not, and another pattern node under patterns operator, which is logical end. Um, so that's simple. And uh, I draw your attention to three dots in pattern node uh, at the beginning and at the end of the argument there, because this allows us 
to neutralize the safe is true parameter place. So yeah, a couple of issues that are important when combining operators together are that um, sometimes it's possible to create the same logic in different ways uh, using different operators, especially using pattern inside. And um, usually the most optimized one wins and there might be some nuances. So yeah, test your rules carefully. Um, the second aspect is that the order of the child patterns, so everything under third line, uh, doesn't affect the final result. So in our example, it doesn't matter if we put pattern either or pattern not first. Cool. So it looks like we're finding bugs now. What can we do about it? <laughs> Great question. So let's move into the autofix feature in SEMGRAP. So first, uh, autofix in SEMGRAP is designed to automatically fix the code. Now we can think, what if SEMGRAP changes something that it shouldn't change, uh, shouldn't be changed. So no worries, you can do a dry run to see what is going on under the hood. And uh, naturally, automatic fixes speed up the process of patching vulnerabilities. And um, we have found this to be very helpful for developers because it also shows them how to fix the bug and they can avoid it in the future. And also there is a fixed regex variant that applies regular expression replacement. So uh, this is very useful for replacing specific parameters uh, as shown uh, in the example from our, one of our private uh, summer pool. And nice. Matt? Yeah, this is pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> so the tool finds all the bugs and then it fixes all the bugs. So like what's stopping this from just replace, replace taking away my job, replacing my job? Is there any limitations of auto fix we should be aware yeah, of? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So generally, uh, autofix is applicable only for basic one-line fixes. It cannot reliably do multi-line. So if a bug is spread between lines of files, uh, it cannot uh, fix it. So no worries. But you know. I get to keep my job for now. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and with my summarizing the key points we have encountered, encountered so far. Yeah, I think we're going to skip over that one just because we're a little short on time. So I'll let you move on to CICD. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, you can run SEMGRIP in CI, and uh, I think that we are not going to talk about it today, but we will in the future webinar. So we have in short, we have SEMGRIP Cloud Platform and we can do standalone CI job setup. So refer to documentation and our recent blog post on how to introduce SEMGRIP in organization for uh, more info and expect our webinar soon. So generally successful SEMGRIP implementation is a complex topic and from using it, it from a security engineer's perspective, through CLI to successful CI implementation. So if you, if you have trouble understanding SEMGRIP's behavior or need support when developing custom rules, the best way to go is SEMGRIP uh, community slack. If you find any problems with the tool, I mean, elements of the programming languages are not covered by the parser reached to GitHub, uh, SEMGRIP GitHub, we have sent a few GitHub issues in the past and they were resolved pretty quickly. And finally, you are welcome to join our testing handbook Slack channel and we are happy to support you there and hear your feedback on uh, testing handbook. Yeah, so, so to sum up, um, all detailed information on, about SEMGRIP can be found in our testing handbook on upset.guide website. Uh, we also recommend that you check our blog. We have a bunch of decent blog posts about cool bugs there related to SEMGRIP. Mm, if you want to see how SEMGRIP behaves in action, check out our public reports on our GitHub. And uh, again, um, use our public SEMGRIP rules. So, uh, Spencer, 
what uh, were the interesting questions we got in the chat? Okay, uh, I've got a few actually here. Let me pull them up. So we have a question from uh, John Terrell, and just just as a, a preface, the uh, similar questions that I I had a good idea of, I, I answered directly in the chat. Um, but uh, th these are the more complex or longer form ones that uh, I thought would be good to answer uh, from the two of you. So John asks, uh, are there any best practices to use SendGrep together with fuzzing tools or any dynamic instrumentation uh, instrumentation frameworks to confirm exploitability? I think that the idea is feeding the output of SendGrep potentially into uh, use of dynamic analysis or fuzzing tools. I can take that one. So I, it doesn't have anything built in, but SEMGREP does have JSON output, so you can really plug and play. I mean, you're going to have to do the glue to glue those together. And I know that's been done uh, a number of ways. I think we've done that a few times at, at Trail of Bits as well for some internal projects. So yeah, nothing off the shelf that I'm aware of, but yeah, I, do, I know it does have structured output, so you can use that um, to, to plug it into other tools. Yeah, one thing that occurs to me is, um, and I'm not especially familiar with fuzzing myself, but um, I imagine that you could at least use SEMGREP to prime a fuzzer with uh, initial weights for what branches might be uh, more fruitful. But that that's something that you would probably have to do a little bit of at least glue code yourself. That's not something that's, that basically SEMGREP's formatting of its output will facilitate you extracting that data pretty easily, but it's not something that uh, is actually implements itself. Um, if we're good to move on to a second question, um, Chris McCullough asks, uh, are there any plans to release a Serif Viewer plugin or extension for other IDs besides VS Code, specifically for JetBrains or IntelliJ? Uh, not this time, but uh, we sometimes use IntelliJ IDEs, so maybe in the future we'll keep, keep it in our mind. Let's see, um, Max Zinkus, uh, this is an interesting one. I, I've been thinking about this myself, actually. Can uh, He asks, can SEMREP monitor or output rule usage metrics to trim unused rules uh, or branches as a performance trade-off or to identify which rules are being entered most often, uh, even if they eventually result in no finding? That might be particularly important, uh, and this is my, my commentary here, but uh, especially if you're integrating SEMGREP into CI and you're potentially paying somebody for compute time to to run your uh, static analysis. Um, trimming rules that are entered frequently but unused could be useful. I, I don't think SEMGREP integrates something like that itself, but I imagine it, it outputs the data uh, necessary to do that with, again, a fairly small amount of glue code. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think that'd be another thing you're building on the structured output with, but I will provide a... <laughs> Maybe a word of caution there, you know, just because you haven't seen something fire in the past doesn't mean it won't fire in the future. So if you have like a buffer overflow rule, it's like, oh, we've never seen this before. And then you kind of like disable the rule and then it comes about, uh, just be a little little cautious with that. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, I, I my, my mind immediately went to the performance concerns, but yeah, the, the, the thing with bugs like that is you never know when they could pop up, um, and you really do kind of just have to run all your rules um, to be sure that they're going to catch something. One Let's thing see. there okay. I do know some organizations will do is they'll have a condensed rule set for CI and then have like a nightly job for all the rules. So if you're concerned about performance, you can kind of split your rule sets up like that. Yeah, you may also be able to vary them based on frequency, um, like bugs that you find uh, often are run every time, but bugs that are found less frequently or maybe that are, are likely to be confined to specific subsections of the code are only run when those parts are updated. Um, you could you could, you could could make a lot of trade-offs there. Um, but okay, let's say for the sake of time, I'll, I'll move on to another question. Um, John Terrell asked a question, uh, and of course I don't have it up in front of me again, but um, he was curious about SEMGREP's taint tracking capabilities. Could you talk a little bit about that?
you want to take that one, Maciej? Yeah, sure. So tent tracking is uh, very important for any lack of sanitization and injection box. So you can track the sink, the source, and what is between. Um, so uh, I think that the best way to is to play with this yourself, take a look at dogs, because uh, there are lots of experimental features that are um, implemented to the same group all the time. And also take a look at the uh, pro version, because some features on time tracking can, uh, can be different on uh, regular version and pro, uh, some group pro engine. Yeah, on, the, on the note of the pro version, oh, sorry, Matt, go, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I believe the free version is interprocedural, so it's just going to be within a function, essentially, and then the pro version is interprocedural. So taint tracking in the free version is just going to be, you know, within a within a function. We actually just got a question also speaking of the pro version um, of whether you have um, an example of a security issue that might be that would be detectable with cross file support, uh, whereas it, it wouldn't be with single file. Yeah, I think you could so, basically imagine like any injection style bug, so cross site scripting, SQL injection, buffer overflows. It's getting user input from one file, from one module, and then it passes through one, 10, 100 other function calls, potentially in different files themselves, and makes its way to uh, a dangerous function like a SQL injection, let's say. Then I think that'd be a, a good example. Basically, when I think about that type of stuff, I just think like injection style bugs are good for data flow and taint tracking. Makes sense. Uh, just want to check up on time um, before I, I, I read any more. Uh, are we are we good to take a couple more questions? Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, someone asks, um, could and this is a question for Matt. Could SEMGREP be paired with something like your route detect tool? I'm actually not familiar with route detect. Oh man, I have followers in the crowd. Uh, route Detect is actually built on SEMGREP, well, partially built on SEMGREP, so you're spot on with that. Basically, so for those unfamiliar, Route Detect um, tries to find authentication and authorization bugs with web application routes, and the way it does that is it uses SEMGREP rules to detect the routes and their authentication and authorization properties, and then it uses some glue code like we were discussing previously, it builds on the JSON output, uh, uses some glue, glue code, and then does some analyses on the results, and then puts it out in like a, a pretty tree graph. But yeah, it's, it's um, SEMGREP is one of the key ingredients for the tool. Makes sense. Uh, we also have a question about, um, this is more general, general one. Um, if you have any, uh, they say SEMGREP burp, burp suite extensions, but maybe more broadly, um, at any any uses of SEMGREP that might integrate with burp suite. Um, and then following following up on, on, on an uh, even more theoretical question, any interesting LLM related ideas uh, involving SEMGREP? Yeah, so uh, when it comes to, to burp, uh, it can catch some potential, I don't know, issues in JavaScript because it can easily scan it and so on. So you can find any client side issues uh, from JavaScript that are caught by uh, burp. Um, so, but I suppose that it can be very um, memory insufficient. Um, that's burp plus SEMGREP. Um, when it comes to LLM, uh, I used it once to ask uh, ask it just make it make this sample pool better just to cover other aspects that are not covered and it really um, found something uh, that is not covered in my role so from this perspective but uh, if you ask for any LM related issues 
Uh, I'm not very fam familiar with that. And Matt, maybe you. I think there's one important thing to mention here, which is the weird dynamics with the AI cyber challenge that DARPA is running, because there might be some things that we discover that we are bursting at the seams to tell the internet, but provide a competitive advantage to us during that competition. <laughs> so um, we're going to be carefully releasing a lot of the things that we, we think are fruitful when it comes to using AI for software security challenges. Uh, but you should definitely pay attention to what happens in that challenge. Because uh, I think at some of the waypoints, you'll get a little glimpse of what a lot of teams are working on in private. Uh, so there's more here to say. Trail of Bits has two whole teams dedicated to AI security, one that focuses on securing AI systems and another that focuses on using AI for security. Uh, so there's a lot of activity happening there, but um, have a have a hard time sharing it right now. <laughs> I guess, pay attention to our blog. Sounds good. Uh, I think that's the end of the questions that we've got in the chat here. Cool. Thanks great. for joining. Yeah, I think we can wrap this up. This is a great first webinar. Thank you to our, to our panelists, our organizers, uh, for the overview of this tool that Trail of Bits relies on quite a bit. Um, just wanted to leave this off with uh, if this is a topic that you're interested in and want to learn more, um, you should def definitely check out our testing handbook. But if this is a, a problem inside your company, absolutely reach out to us. We do engagements where there are source code reviews that use SEMGREP, and we also have SEMGREP specific projects where we'll actually write custom rules and perfect fit it, you know, be best fit it to the code base that you've developed. Um, so just reach out to us. We're pretty friendly. Uh, and always willing to talk about helping people get, get a leg up with technologies like this. So thanks a lot for coming, and I hope that you come back to our next one. See ya. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, everybody.